Good afternoon. Welcome to Lecture 3, Psychology in Context. Before we begin, I want to discuss some of the housekeeping items. And so I'm just going to go over each one very quickly. First, upload all assignments and e-courses. Second, utilize uh, the resource page to help you with your writing assignments. There are several excellent websites um, and links that can help you with grammar and also sentence structure and uh, writing. Um, re you have the opportunity to resubmit a reaction paper one and two, so you can respond to my comments. Again, I just want to reiterate that this is a writing intensive course and that you will have multiple opportunities to turn in your assignments. So I um, expect that students will take advantage of that because there are um, three things that are critical um, if you are earning a degree in psychology and employers, as well as if you're planning to go to graduate school, um, employers and professors in graduate programs um, expect students to have after they graduate. And the first is to be able to think critically. The second one is to um, communicate in multiple contexts. The first context is uh, orally, so can you present? So again, I'm gonna recapture, restate one critical thinking, and the second, um, if you can speak well. The third is the second context that um, employers and professors expect for you, especially if you're going to graduate school, is to write well. And so in the writing intensive courses, um, and we have, as a department, we have just recently uh, began to focus on identifying classes that will be writing intensive. And this is one of them, reading and research, so that you will have that technical skill uh, as it relates to your major, psychology. Um, how do you become um, a proficient uh, writer? So resubmit your reaction paper one and two so you can respond to my comments. Remember, it might not say extra credit in the uh, PowerPoint. It might say application exercises. Application exercises are extra credit opportunities. So take advantage of the extra credit. And I always, 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 always share with students. Continue to ask questions. And um, as you know by now, I will share questions uh, that students pose to the entire class if I think those questions are relevant and can be extremely helpful. So just a quick recap of this uh, slide. One, upload all of your assignments and e-courses. And also when you're uploading your assignments, please make sure that it's a Word document uh, rather than a PDF. Um, please submit all of your assignments as Word documents rather than PDFs. Uh, utilize the resources page to help you with your writing assignments. Again, employers and if you're planning to attend graduate school, professors uh, will expect for you to be able to think uh, critically, um, be able to communicate well um, orally, meaning your speaking skills, and uh, most importantly, the, they expect for you to be able to communicate well um, as a writer and have writing proficiencies. Again, you have uh, multiple opportunities to submit your assignments. So um, please uh, submit reaction paper one and two. And then the final uh, weeks in class, you'll be able to uh, submit the other reaction papers as well. Remember, application exercises are extra credit. So I hope that you will take advantage of the extra credit opportunities in the class and then continue to ask questions. Writing tips. As I shared before, this class is a writing intensive one. So these tips are to help you um, become more proficient writers and to master the craft, the technical writing um, that you would need to have as a psychology major. So one of the things that I noticed when I read um, reaction papers one and two, and these are my writing tips. And they include edit and proof. And I can't really stress this, edit and proof edit and proof, and then guess what? Edit and proof again. Before you submit um, your document, uh, review subject verb agreement. That is so important. So sometimes when you are writing 
you're thinking psychologist with an S, but because you're typing, you might forget to add the S and then you might have a, a subject and verb agreement that are not correct because you're using a singular, um, you're using a plural verb for a singular noun. And so it's just those little things that, um, that when you're writing and people only have what's on the paper. So I always share with um, students and also with my colleagues when I'm reviewing their writing is that the only thing that I have is what's on the paper. I can infer, I can hypothesize, I can speculate, but I can really only go with what's on the paper. So if you have the psychologist have, that's incorrect subject verb agreement. So please just make sure that you um, review your paper for subject verb agreement or if you put they is instead of they are. Subject verb agreement, please pay close attention to subject verb agreement and you can go to Purdue Owl and they have a very good section on subject verb agreement. And use strong verbs. There's uh, in the research section um, two two uh, links that lead you to strong verbs. And so one of the things that I encourage uh, students to do is to learn the strong verb list so that you can use them in your writing. And also check for complete sentences. Sometimes when people are writing, they, have, they pretty much use writing to get all of their thoughts out in one sentence. So make sure that your sentences have one complete thought and not multiple thoughts. I mean, the thoughts could be great, but if they're um, in one sentence and the punctuation isn't clear, then it's just a long series of thoughts um, that, as for the reader, you have to try to understand and make sure, okay, what is it ac exactly saying? So make sure that you have one complete thought in a sentence. And um, I think that's it. So I think I've gone over it. Edit and proof, review sub subject verb agreement, use strong verbs, check for complete sentences, and that's including what I just said um, before, or right after it, is to have only one complete thought per sentence. That's extremely important. Resubmission deadlines. Resubmit your reaction papers. They were due on Monday. And um, you can submit um, your peer critique handout, which I posted on um, eCourses because some, some of you shared with me that it was hard to manipulate as a PDF. And so I um, sent it as a Word document. Um, your partner's paper. Every time you do a peer critique assignment, you have one more assignment that's coming up, you submit the peer critique and you submit your partner's paper. Peer critique in your partner's paper. And just like I submitted my comments to you using the comments tool in Word, I think it's great for you to submit comments to your um, peer partner using uh, the comment tool as well. And so you submit the peer critique handout, your partner's paper um, for the peer critique. And some of you might need to submit both. The peer critique handout and your partner's paper. Alrighty. So what is context? Because the this uh, week's work uh, that you, well last week's work, it's um, the third week, focused on context and what is context. And people talk about context all the time. This is the context of the situation, context of the phone conversation, context of this, context of that. So basically what context um, what it means is uh, context represents the background, the environment, the framework setting, or situation surrounding any type of event or occurrence. And so sometimes people will say, well, let me tell you the context of what happened. Or let me tell you the context of the situation. Or let me tell you the environmental context in which someone lives. And so context is giving you that background information, it's rich description of whatever the uh, framework setting or situation that you are talking about. And again, it's the rich description, being able to tell people what is the context, what is the time period that someone is living in, what is the type of neighborhood someone is living in. All of those things represent context. Who are the people? What are they doing? What are the activities? All of that represents context. 
It also, context, um, includes the circumstances that form the setting for an event or settings. And um, it's basically used to try to understand or assess um, particular, a particular type of environment or particular types of uh, situations. And so again, context is very descriptive. Extra credit question. What is the environmental setting of your book selection? Meaning, guess what? The context. So there are three steps to conceptualization to, oper, oper, to oper, operational um, or oper, operationalization. Now, conceptualization to operationalization um, includes defined concepts, um, identify variables corresponding with those concepts, uh, concepts and then develop measurement procedures, which is the operationalization piece. And I'm quite sure if you have taken um, experimental or research methods, you have learned how to operationalize variables. That means to define them and to measure them. And that's also something that you um, do when you're talking about um, context and understanding what conceptualization is. So. What are conceptualizations? Uh, they represent uh, collections of related observations and experiences. Um, they're mental um, images that researchers use to summarize um, devices bringing together observations. Oh, I see that I um, typed that uh, twice or in my um, cut and paste, cut and paste that twice. So excuse me for that um, typo. But it's um, bringing together observations and experiences that seem to have common experience, that seem to have um, common experiences slash situations. So in your readings in Garcia Cole and their integrative model, they provide a conceptual conceptualization, a conceptual model um, regarding uh, childhood development. When you're reading Bronfenbrenner's um, model and understanding his ecological system, that's a conceptualization. The conceptualization of what these, e these different ecological systems that an individual navigates. So I want you to really begin to think about these um, conceptual pictures, these diagrams, these mental images that are in these articles for ways that you can understand the context of how children live their daily experiences. And so let's, let's just play around for a couple of minutes. So indulge me in this little exercise that we're getting ready to do. So concepts are mental images and they're labels like chair, female, social class, and grade point average. Now, um, comments, I mean concepts have to get put into the lexicon, into, into our everyday language of what we're doing. And how does that happen? And so I'm not trying to be political. I'm gonna say that again. I'm not trying to be political. I'm gonna say it more at a time. I'm not trying to be political. I'm not trying to be political. But let's look at the example of birther. We all know what a birther is, but did we know what a birther was before 2008? A birther, that's a concept. It got placed in a mental in mental images in regards to President Obama's what? Birthplace. So now when people say birther, we have a mental image. We know exactly what it means. We know what the concept means. And so that's what it means by mental images. And you can think about a lot of different things that um, we use in everyday language that first starts off as a concept and then it gives a mental image. So you can think about feminism, sexism. All of these things are uh, concepts that now lead to particular mental mental images about um, about women or about what is a birther, and so um, those are examples of mental mental images and concepts. So again, I put in um, in this uh, PowerPoint. I really want this particular slide. I really want to focus on concepts and these mental images. And so when you're reading about these conceptual models and they're putting forth these hypotheses, because we know that a hypothesis is the beginning process and then a, a, um, 
a theory is a final process and you have to have that replication over time before you can get to a theory so you can't have a study you can't just do one study and say my theory is no you have to replicate it over and over and over again and so the concept piece is at the beginning stage of this research process so I'm You've learned about the scientific model if you've had general psychology, experimental, uh, statistics, research methods. So you know you have to start off with a concept. It's your idea. How do you go about um, operationalizing that? And so concepts over here to operationalization over here. And so I want you, when you're reading these, uh, these models on families and children, to really understand the concepts and the mental images that they're putting to explain these con these complex representations of how humans, us human beings, navigate multiple multiple systems. And so, again, concepts are these mental images. You have a very good um, conceptual model for childhood development, which I'm going to talk about later with Garcia Cole, and also a very good mental um, mental images of the Bronfenbrenner model. Now, um, the conceptualization process allows us to revi refine our concepts into potential variables. And so for your third question, and this is a hint for your third question, your, it's not really a hint, I'm just, I'm getting ready to tell you. So in your third question you're going to have to consider you're going to have to come up with a research question you're going to have to define it and you're going to have to show me a conceptual model of using the models these articles from week three week two and week one to explain a particular phenomenon in your book and so you're going to have to tell me what the concepts are, and then you're going to have to operationalize it, meaning you're going to have to define the variables and how they're going to be measured. Okay? So, concept mapping, which is, which is what is shown in the um, Garcia Cole article, when it talks about the integrative model for children, that's a map. That's a framework, it's a model. It's telling you these relationships and it um, gives you a pictorial form about a particular topic. And so that's why I want you to begin to think about this conceptual mapping. How do you get these concepts together so that you can answer the third question for your final, which I'm going to post next week. Operational definitions. Now again, you should know what operational definitions are by now because you've taken, uh, you should have taken by now, um, experimental research methods and some of you are getting ready to take senior paper which you're going to have to know how to operationalize definitions. Now again, what is operational definitions? It's when you define your variable of interest. So um, it's the process of creating um, definitions for something that could be measured. So I'm going to ask you, what are your concepts of this research, um, of the research question that you're interested in, and what are the operational definitions? What are you trying to measure? And um, it's the development of specific research um, procedures that will result in empirical observations, meaning that you can propose hypotheses after you have done operation, after you operational operationalize um, your variables and after you define them you can begin to do a study and so that's what it means right here when we're talking about these empirical observations. SES, these are some um, definitions. It's a definite, it's defined as a combination of income and education and you will measure that by what? Um, you can do that by self-report, what is your income? Uh, you could do it in a kind in a in a um, you could do it in a scale response, starting with um, um, with a starting with um, particular range of SES. So you can say two, uh, 
$20,000, you know, $30,000, $40,000, know, $80,000 or above. And then you can do the same thing for education. So, um, and for education, it could be, <coughs> excuse me, some high school, high school diploma, some college, college degree, PhD, MD, JD. Okay, so those are the ways in which you can define, define variables of interest. And then um, in qualitative work, um, you can do the same thing with um, uh, operationalizing uh, definitions, but it also depends on the type of qualitative work that you're doing and um, if it's either descriptive or interpretive. And so that will um, allow you to, um, that will guide you in the way in which you would um, operationally define qualitative work. But for this class, this class right here, we're not really gonna be focusing on qualitative work. We're gonna be focusing on quantitative work. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is what you've learned thus far in your um, research and stat series um, here in our program, which would be uh, stats one, stats two, experimental design, research methods, and then culminating that in taking senior paper and actually showing, uh, showing us, the faculty, that you have mastered these skill sets. And so that's why you're taking reading and research because this will allow you to actually work on those skills, bring everything together that you've learned in those classes, and to begin to show your proficiency and what you have learned across the curriculum uh, in psychology. That was just a side note. So again, let's have a review. From conceptualization to operationalization. So when you're walking around at home, on campus, driving in your car, I want you to be thinking about these three steps to, I want you to say it one more time. Again, let's say it together. Conceptualization to operation, operationalization. All right, so we have conceptualization to operationalization. You need to define your concepts. You need to identify um, variables corresponding to that concept, and then you need to operationally define them with, on, with how you're going to measure them, okay? So you have it, you gotta define your concept, identify the variables, and then you have to operationally define them. The three steps to say it, operationalization two. One more time, conceptualization two. Operal, operationalization. One more time, conceptualization two. Operationalization. And you know what the three steps are. So, if you can answer an extra credit this is a spontaneous extra credit that you can only get if you listen to the video. Spontaneous extra credit. Tell me one concept in your book. I want you to identify two variables related to that concept. And then I want you to operationally define it. Okay, I'm gonna be looking for that response on Friday. Now, we're going to put it all together. So why did I just go over all of that? Is that what you're thinking? I would be thinking the same thing. Why, 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 why did she go over all of that? So I'm going to tell you. First, you're reading about different um, models and frameworks for understanding child development and human development. And I, I kind of talked about that. Bronfenbrenner, Garcia Cole, the... Uh, nature versus nurture um, slides in the um, PowerPoint. So are you on the nature versus nurture? Because that debate has been going on for decades, centuries. Which one is it? Nature? Is it all ge genetically based? We're just these genetically based animals and whatever genetic combination that we have. 
that's just who we're going to become? Or is it the nurture? Is it the environmental what? The environmental what? Context setting situation, the environmental context that influences human behavior. So that's something, that's a model. That's a framework that's out there. And as psychologists, we test these different frameworks and models and try to see if they will allow us to explain, investigate, and understand, comprehend human behavior. And um, you do need to know how to conceptualize and operationalize. I mean, that's what we do um, if you decide to do research, is conceptualization, operationalization, which leads to us doing studies. And one of the things that you're going to need to do is you're going to need to utilize two of these models, at least two, to understand your book selection. So if you chose the blue aside, what are the concepts? What are the, what are the social challenges within your book that you can understand a concept, define that concept, and then operationalize that concept to lead to some type of measure. Is it self-esteem? I don't know. Is it identity development? Guess what? I don't know. It's gonna, you're gonna have to tell me. You're gonna have to tell me. Is it socialization? Is it income? Is it educational level? You are going to have to tell me what you think it is. I'm just throwing it out. For the pack, is it education, peer networks, parental socialization, neighborhood characteristics? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just throwing stuff out. You have to read the book and you got to tell me. Okay? That's all I'm saying. But you're going to have to use these three steps. Define concepts. Identify variables corresponding to those concepts. And then develop measures to operationalize on how you would measure it. Alrighty, so I hope that this is clear. If it's not, please email me or call me or come out by office hours. So putting it all together, we had again, as I said before, so list the models, nature versus nurture. Which one is it? What do you believe? You've been reading the articles, going over the PowerPoint slides. You're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to make a decision. Is it the ecological model? Is it the integrative model on childhood? Is it the family strengths model? You're going to have to make a decision on which one do you believe is the best one to answer the social challenge in the book that you're reading. That's what you're going to have to do. Is it nature versus nurture? Is it genetics? Are we predestined to the lives that we eventually have because this is a genetic makeup that we have? Or is it nurture? Is it that is it the parenting styles that you're the parenting styles? The nurturing style of your social support network, of your family network, or your fictive kin network, you know your play lessons. Is it your play cousins that have a really good um, impact on you? Was it your teachers? I mean, was it the kind of environment that you were raised in? Was it that grit that um, Dwok was talking about? What is it? Nature versus nurture. Nature versus nurture. Why are we who we are? Is it Ruffenbrunner? Ruffenbrunner's model talks about the micro system, the immediate surroundings of that's impacting um, a person or a child? Is it peers? Is it family? Is it friends? Is it the meso system? The interconnections between two or more systems? Is it the family and the school? Is it the exo system? You know, the context in which a person lives in or a child is in, but, but does not have an active role, but it's influenced by it anyway. If you're looking at children, it would be what? The school board. Do, do children actually have any impact over the school board? Do they? But that would be the example of an exosystem. The macro, which is the culture of that particular, of that particular, um, the culture that that child is um, engaging in. 
that's that it's the culture that um, the individual is maturing in okay so that's it or is it the kernel system is it the time period so children growing up in the 80s versus children going up, children growing up in the 2000s what is so unique about your chrono system that's unique to that particular time period of your book that's the chrono system okay and this is Bronfenbrenner's model okay. Bronfenbrenner's model excuse me okay now this is Garcia's cold integrative model on child development especially for minority children so they have all of these variables and what you need to do is to think about are these variables individual level characteristics of the child are they are they what micro meso exo macro chrono so when you're going back, I want you to ask, ask yourself. So when you're sitting at home and you're like, oh my God, I think I better go and read for Dr. Martin's class. I want you to try to answer that question. So look, social position variables, race, social class, ethnicity, gender. Do they have any impact on uh, right here? Racism, prejudice, discrimination, oppressive, oppression. Then it leads into kind of segregational, residential, economic, social, and psychological. Then they have these promoting and inhibiting environments. So is it schools? Is it neighborhoods? Is it healthcare? And then it goes to these adaptive culture. Is it tradition and cultural legacies that's related to socialization? Um, economic and political histories, migration and acculturation, current contextual demands of that particular community. And then they can lead to all of these child characteristics, can impact family roles, family values and belief systems, and then lead to all of these different developmental competencies, cognitive, social, emotional, linguistic, biculturalism, coping with um, aspects of racism. So I want you to think about this integrative model. What sections resonate with you? How do each one of these, if you had to place Bronfenbrenner's model, if you had to integrate this model of Bronfenbrenner with this child development model, where would these boxes fall? Individual, Meso, eso, macro, chrono. I want you to critically think about this model and Bronfenbrenner's model. And then the family systems approach, same thing. I want you to think about Geistia Cole's model, Bronfenbrenner's model, if you had to juxtapose, juxtapose, put them right next to each other, juxtapose, put them right next to each other, and tell me, what do you think? Where does the integrative model fit in Bronfenbrenner's model? Where does the family systems approach fit in Garcia Cole and Bronfenbrenner's model? I want you to think critically about how these are related and how they are similar, but also how they are different. I want you to really think about it. So family strength approach, helps to prevent crisis by meeting needs early. Intervenes after crisis occurs. And so again, you have to think about this in uh, strength base versus medical model. And so that's where these two um, models emanate from. Medical model, traditional services versus this strength base approach. And so I want you to think about these three models, Bronfenbrenner, no, it's actually Bronfenbrenner, Garcia Cole, and the family strength approach, and how they're related to uh, each other. Any questions, please call me, email me, and um, let me know your thoughts about the lecture. Thank you so much. Have a great day.